President Biden told Israel to pound sand and Israel told America, get rid of this guy. I'll have all the details coming up on In Focus. You know how sometimes when you like are looking for something on Google, you end up with something else. And then after you get the thing that you didn't mean to get, you end up thinking, well, maybe it was uh, important that that this is what I got. Maybe it was meant to be. So last night um, I was trying to remember this um, statement that was made by a woman named Sabine Tassa from Nativa Salah, a moshav very close to Gaza that was invaded on October 7th. And she was talking about how the uh, handyman from Gaza that worked in everybody's houses uh, named Khalil was actually a Hamas spy. And that was how they knew uh, who lived where, who had a gun, who had a dog, who had children, how old the children were, um, who worked for the army, who was in the army, who was in the police, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And where, of course, all the guns in the Tiba Salah were. So uh, I was looking for that. Uh, film of uh, Sabine because uh, Jonathan Cordicus, I think one of the IDF uh, spokespeople who was brought in for reserves, I think he's a, he's a lieutenant colonel or a colonel. Anyway, he did a, he did a Twitter space and uh, he was, he gave the data. He said that the large majority of the, of the murderers who invaded Israel on October 7th weren't actually uh, official members of Hamas. They were just regular Innocent civilians, uninvolved civilians, that you had more innocent, innocent, uninvolved civilians who invaded Israel, who burned our families alive, who raped our women, who kidnapped our people, and who sadistically murdered uh, the victims on October 7th, who were not a part of Hamas, who were just regular folks from Gaza, men, women, and children, um, then you had actual uniformed Hamas terrorists who had trained for this mission for years. So um, uh, as a result, I was looking to see um, see the video of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, Sabine Tassa talking about uh, this man, Khalil, who had worked in everybody's house and everybody we thought was so wonderful and gentle. And actually, uh, he was a Hamas intelligence officer, and he was getting all of the information on the people who lived in Atiba Asara and bringing it to Hamas. So instead of finding that short clip of her talking about it, I saw a half an hour interview with um, with Sabine Tassa and one of her sons, his name is Corinne, he is 12 years old. And people who saw the idea of spokesman uh, tape or video or movie of the atrocities from October 7th uh, saw Corinne together with his younger brother, uh, Shai, uh, they're 12 and 8 years old, uh, in, the, in the movie it was one of the most arresting portions of the film because or one of the most traumatizing portions of the film because the boys had been with their father and their father jumped on a hand grenade in order to save them and then the Hamas uh, terrorists who had been uh, attacking them, they were in a they were in a shelter. Uh, sort of forced them back into their house, and they were there, and they were talking amongst themselves. And the Hamas terrorists were drinking their Coca Cola and eating their food while these two boys are talking about one uh, shy, the eight year old, lost his eye, and he was saying that he was blind. And um, and Corinne was talking about how he wanted to die and how they killed the, their father. And then the film people who watched the film didn't know if these two boys had been kidnapped, if they were murdered, what happened, and and uh, the answer wasn't given to them. And so the answer is yes, thank God they survived because they were able to run away. The terrorists left for whatever reason, and they ran to their mother, uh, who was next door, and she let them into her house, and um, and they were in the safe room. They were both very wounded. Uh, Shai particularly was wounded by the hand grenade that their father jumped on in order to save their lives, and um, Corinne was also wounded. Um, their older brother uh, was murdered. Uh, he had left uh, 10 minutes before the bombing began to go to the beach, 
at Zikim and Hamas sent over 10 rubber boats with 12 terrorists in each boat to massacre everybody on the beach and then move on. And so their older brother, their oldest brother, 17-year-old Orr, was uh, executed, uh, shot in the head, and actually his execution was, like the father's uh, death, were captured by uh, GoPro cameras that the Hamas terrorists were wearing uh, when they carried out the execution and then broadcast uh, on their telegraph page, telegram pages, Facebook, etc. So Orr, 17, was murdered, and the 15-year-old brother was with the mom in the safe room, and he was in a state of shock, and the two boys came in and they were wounded. And so the interview that I watched last night, it was uh, taped uh, like late October on the popular show on Channel 14, The Patriots. So it's um, Sabine and uh, Corinne talking about what happened. And um, it was a... It was a very hard interview to watch it right before bed. It was a bad idea. But um, so at the end, uh, the host, you know, and Magal asked, um, first he asked Corinne if he had a message for the prime minister and 12-year-old boy that he is, he said he couldn't think of anything he wanted to say to the prime minister. And the mother said, yeah, she motioned, I do. And so we know and I turned to her and I just want to play a clip of what she said here. Very short, promise. אתה רוצה להגיד משהו לראש הממשלה אם הוא שומע אותך? יש לך מה להגיד? לא יודע. את רוצה? כן. בבקשה. תמחקו את עזה. אני רוצה שתמחקו את עזה. אין אימון. אין פרטנר לשלום. תמחקו את עזה מהמפה. אני רוצה פצצת הירושימה. אני מוכנה לנדוד עשר שנים. אנחנו נחזור לנתיב העשרה. אנחנו נקום על הרגליים, אנחנו עם חזק, עברנו הולוקוסט, ועברנו יום שחור, אבל never again. So what is she saying here? She's saying, what is reasonable? You know, we want to go home. She, she had said before the part that I just showed you, she said, yes, I want to go back to Nativa uh, Asara, the house that my husband built. They were saved because their husband anticipated the invasion and he built the house as a bunker. so that it was concrete frame so that it couldn't be burned down to the ground. It had uh, uh, doors that were fireproof and that were um, with, with the best locks in Israel so they couldn't get in. Same thing, their safe room had a lock on it so that when they blasted their way in, they couldn't get to the family in the safe room. So that's why they were able to survive, the mother and the three surviving sons, because they had anticipated the invasion, because they knew, they saw what was going on in Gaza, And they know that there's, you know, we can't defend ourselves for, for years. The residents of the uh, border communities with Gaza had been warning that Hamas was preparing for war, that they were watching them, that they were building guard towers. There was one right directly across from Nativa Asara that was put up just a few weeks before the invasion. And it was used on October 7th to blow down the uh, intelligence balloon that was in the air. So... They, they, they knew that this was going to happen. They saw what was going on on the other side of the fence. But the security geniuses in the army and Benny Gantz and Gadi Eisenkot, both uh, former IDF chiefs of general staff, they, they were in love with this concept of defense as the basis for our security strategy, that all we have to do is build this big fence and, and everything will be fine. And they'll do their thing and we'll do ours and never the twain shall meet. And of course, that was a complete lie and it doesn't work. And so what, what Sabine Tassa is saying here, she's an incredible woman, and uh, so, so powerfully, she's saying, you know, I want to go back to the house that my husband built us. I want to raise my kids there. I want to go back to the scene of the murder. I want to live there. That's our home. But I can't go unless the army does its job and wipes Gaza off the face of this planet. This isn't a, 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 a demand for revenge, although she's certainly justified in demanding vengeance for what happened to her family. She, it's not for vengeance. It's for the preservation of life. It's for the preservation of this country, right? It's for the preservation of the Jewish people. And by the way, and we'll talk about this in a second, uh, the preservation of freedom on earth. And It's all very much contingent on an eradicating Hamas. And again, you know, this is a society that is devoted to genocide, which is what Kornikus explained simply by giving the numbers. 
that there were several more thousand civilians from Gaza who invaded Israel and conducted the slaughter of October 7th than there were actually uniformed terrorists who in, were engaged in it, okay? So these are things that are important, and I wanted to begin my discussion of the arms embargo that the Biden administration has just uh, declared against Israel officially yesterday with an interview by uh, Biden on CNN. Um, and we'll just show this clip real quick. I made it clear that if they go into Rafa, they haven't gone into Rafa yet. If they go into Rafa, I'm not supplying the weapons that have been used historically to deal with Rafa, to deal with the cities, to deal with that problem. We're going to continue to make sure Israel is secure in terms of Iron Dome and their ability to respond to attacks like came out of the, uh, in, uh, the Middle East recently. But it's, uh, it's, it's just wrong. We're not, gonna we're not gonna supply the weapons and the artillery shells used that have been used. Artillery shells as well. Yeah, artillery shells. So what did Biden say here? What he said was, I opened up by saying pound sand. What he said was, you can defend yourself. You can, how do you defend yourself? Uh, well, along the lines of the security fence that all of the geniuses who were running our IDF and our security apparatuses for, for decades said, this is how we do it, right? We build a big wall and then everything will be fine, right? No. So he was saying the same thing. Uh, you know, you won the war with Iran, right? When you intercepted 300 uh, crews and ballistic missiles and drones, right? You won it. You're not allowed to go after Iran. What, you want to go on offense? No, 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 no. You you Jewish people, all you're allowed to do is intercept incoming projectiles. You are not allowed to go after Iran or any of its terror proxies, whether it's Gaza, whether it's Lebanon, whether it's the Houthis, whether it's the Palestinian Authority. Um, it doesn't matter. All you're allowed to do is thwart incoming projectiles, and they're allowed to get as strong as they want to. And in fact, the United States of America is going to give them billions of dollars, each each separately and all of them together, and Iran directly, uh, in order to pay them off and let them be as strong as they want. Because you're going to be cowering in your shelters on the other side of the fence, and that's all you're allowed to do. Okay? That's all you're allowed to do. That's the, that's the ironclad guarantee of Israel's defense and Israel's security that the Biden administration is offering because any offensive operation that you do is, gonna be, is going to make you into a pariah state. We're, gonna, we're embargoing offensive arms to Israel. He said, you know, all of the aircraft or, or Air Force ordinance that Israel is dependent on because the United States convinced us not to build our own fighter jet, the Levy in the 1980s, by saying... You can have an ironclad guarantee that we will provide you with the uh, uh, fighter bomb, fighter jets, and with the with the bombs that you need, uh, etc. We're going to give you the F-16s and later the F-35s, etc. And you're fine. And this is your strategic arm. And the United States guarantees that. And now, in our hour of need, they say, "No, you have no air force anymore. We're not giving you any of the bombs that you need in order to attack your enemies from the air. We're done with that." You know, no artillery cover for your ground forces because we're denying you artillery shells. Same thing with tank shells. And this has been going on for months. You know, I've been talking about how they've been uh, uh, slow walking the transfer of the artillery and the tank and, and the aircraft ordinance uh, to Israel since, I think, January. Right. It began in January. And uh, so here we have it. Now it's out in the open. President Biden himself is saying, no, all you're allowed to do is defend yourself. And when you're faced with enemies who exist in order to wipe the Jewish people off the face of the earth, he's saying, we're siding with the Hitler. We're siding with the Nazis. We're siding with the people who want to put you on cattle cars. But in today's version of that, which is nuclear bombs for Iran, which is chemical weapons and, and 150,000 rockets and missiles and mortars of all of all uh, ranges to Hezbollah and Hamas remaining in charge of Gaza, retaining its conventional forces, retaining its regime, and we're going to seize control even of your ability to have a maritime blockade of, of, of Gaza by building them their own port that's going to be guaranteed by the United States. We're going to do all of this while pretending that we have your back, that we have an ironclad commitment to Israel's security. Okay, that's what, the, that's what Biden 
just said. He said, I have totally betrayed Israel. I am totally betraying the Jews. And that's another aspect to it. It's not just the Jews in Israel who are betrayed by this. He was Bill Ekman said it uh, on Twitter, who is somebody that all of you should be paying attention to because he says a lot of really smart things. And on Twitter, he said, look, you know, Biden uh, says, you know, that if, obviously it sends a terrible message to Hezbollah and Hamas and, and, and Iran that, you know, in its hour of need, the United States is turning tail on, on Israel and, and embargoing weapons uh, transfers to Israel. But, it, you know, it also tells all of the anti-Semitic rioters on campus that violence pays, that anti-Semitism pays. That if you attack Jewish faculty and students systematically over a period of seven months to the point where you're turning campuses from sea to shining sea on fire in, in, this, in this inferno of Jew hatred, not only will you not be punished for it, you will be rewarded. I am going to, I am going to answer your demands. You're demanding that the United States betray Israel and stand with the people who massacred the Tassa family and their neighbors in Nativa Asara and in Be'eri and in Nachal Oz and in Neo Oz and in Kfar Aza and in Netivot and in Sterot. Cool. And of course, at the Nova Party, then yes, we, we are standing with them. We are standing with the Palestinians. We are standing with Hamas. We are standing with Iran. We are standing with Hezbollah. Right? That's what they're saying. That's exactly what they're saying. Violence pays. Anti-Semitism pays. You are going to be rewarded for what you did on campuses. Look, a week after your your protest tents were were very gently taken down, and you're saying it was an act of genocide against you on Columbia campus because you're you can get away with it because we're giving you a pass because we're letting you break the law. Not only are we letting you break the law, we are abiding by your demands. We're cutting off offensive weapons to Israel, and all we're letting these Jew boys do is protect themselves with uh, missiles uh, that we're going to give them because we're nice and we have an ironclad guarantee of Israel's security, right? That's that's precisely the message that Biden is giving to the anti-Semitic rioters uh, on college campuses. I have your back. I'm with you. I heard your voices. I heard your voices. And here, I'm embargoing the evil Israelis. We're, I'm embargoing the Tassa family. I'm not going to let them uh, return home to Nativa Asara. I'm not going to let the tens of thousands of Israelis who live in the border communities in, in the north with Hezbollah go home. They're not going to be able to go home because it's not just a question of Rafa. Israel, a uh, senior diplomatic official, said this morning Israel has the munitions that we need in order to carry out the Battle of Rafa. And the senior diplomatic source said it. He said, look, you know, it is a problem for the message that it sends to Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran, to be sure. But what he what what the senior source didn't say was you know what what does it mean because we're still waiting for the big battle. Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said the other day that he expects us to go into a major ground operation, major ground war with Hezbollah in the summer. So what the Americans are saying is no, you're not going to be able to go after Hezbollah. We're not going to support you. In fact, we'll condemn you at the UN Security Council and we'll turn you into inter international pariah. And we're going to. Not only are we going to withhold offensive arms from Israel, but we're going to, uh, instead, it's possible that we're going to initiate a uh, an international arms embargo against you under a UN Security Council resolution. It certainly could happen. The United States is openly betraying Israel. That's what's happening. The United States, under the Biden administration, is siding now, without any question, without blinking, with Hamas, with the people who killed 1,200 Israelis on October 7th. Again, not just Hamas. It's the Palestinian people. It's the over 80% of Palestinians in Judea and Samaria and Gaza who are ecstatic over what happened on October 7th. It's them that the Biden administration is standing with against Israel. And, you know, the question is, what is this about? Is this really about Michigan? Is this really because Biden thinks that the way to, to, to win the elections is by going all out Jew hater? Um, I'm not sure. Let me just give you the results. Axios ran a poll that was published yesterday of college students and said that the uh, margin of error is 2.7%. So the numbers are pretty remarkable. It works out that the issue that college students, so that you know, college age young Americans, which are supposed to be the demographic that Biden is most concerned about, 
right? The, in, the, the issue that interests them the least is the conflict in the Middle East. Let me just go through the numbers because they're, they're important. The, um, the, they asked the college students, they gave them nine issues, and they asked them to say which one, you know, to, to rank them in terms of importance. Or maybe they just asked, what, is the, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? One or the other. Either it was a ranking thing or they said, you know, how many of you care about this? How many of you care about that? Probably the latter because it's easier to do. So health care reform is a top issue that college kids care about. Forty percent of them care about health care reform. Education funding and access is a close second. Thirty eight percent of American college students say that uh, economic fairness and opportunity is most important to them. 37% of American college students say that racial justice and civil rights is the most important issue for them. 36% of college students on American college campuses say that climate change is the most important subject for them. 35% say that gun control and gun safety is the most important issue on the agenda as far as they're concerned. 32% say that immigration policies is the most important issue for them going into the November elections. 21% said that national security and terrorism are the most important issues for them going into the elections in November. And 13%, 13% of college students in the United States said the conflict in the Middle East is the most important issue for them. 13%, not even close. The, you know, I mean, Unbelievable. 15, well, no, 15% said national security and terrorism. Did I say 21? 21 was in immigration policies. 15% national security, terrorism, and 13% the conflict in the Middle East. So the conflict in the Middle East is the least important issue for college students in the United States. So if you're trying to go after their votes, you, you inflame the issue that's least important to them. That's an incredible thing. Again, it just shows you're going to lose Pennsylvania. You know, the, the Biden administration, Senator John Fetterman, who is a Democrat, said he has a sharp disagreement with the Biden administration over what they just did to Israel, that he totally opposes limitations on arms sales to Israel completely. And he is more popular now than he was when he was elected. And the most popular politician in Pennsylvania today, this is according to Richard Baer, who was my guest earlier this week on the show, is, is Democratic Governor Josh Shapiro, who is a proud Jew, who has been a stalwart supporter of Israel since October 7th and an opponent of anti-Semitism since October 7th. According to Richard, I have not been following him, but he said he's been even stronger than Fetterman on this issue, and Fetterman has been, has been stellar on this issue. So you have two Democrats in statewide offices in Pennsylvania, Fetterman and Shapiro, who are both uh, totally... Uh, uh, totally opposed to anything. I mean, I don't want to say totally opposed. I don't know what Shapiro says. I, I'm basing it on, on what Richard Baer said, but certainly Fetterman has been the only Democratic senator who has openly uh, parted ways with the White House over its mistreatment of Israel. That tells you about the mood in, in Pennsylvania. And, you know, here you are, you're risking Pennsylvania without which you cannot win the election, not to mention the rest of the swing states. And and you're moving forward with this policy. Why? Why is this the Biden administration policy? My friend Lee Smith wrote an important article in, in Tablet about it, about Biden is saving Hamas. Why is Biden saving Hamas? And 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 you should read it yourself and and um, uh, and look into it. I do want to just add one last thing about the poll. It says that a large majority, 81% of the students say, they support holding protesters accountable. They agree with the notion that those who destroyed po property or vandalized or illegally occupied vi buildings should be held responsible for uh, by their university. Okay, and 67% say that occupying campus buildings is unacceptable. 58% say that it's not acceptable to refuse a university's order to disperse. And another 90% said blocking pro-Israel students from parts of the campus is unacceptable. But here's Joe Biden you know, giving in to this mob of campus anti-Semites um, and, and sticking it to Israel, right? And, and so, you know, the, the, the question is why? And the answer is that this really is not about politics. 
I just want to show you another uh, video, this one of uh, pro-Palestinian protesters in New York. Look at the flag that they are burning. Right. They're burning old glory. They're burning the American flag. They're not just calling death to the Jews. They're not just calling death to Israel. They're calling death to America, just like they do in Iran, which is behind a lot of these protests through its proxies, Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, and all the rest. Of them. And here I just want to read a tweet by Congressman Brian Mast uh, from Florida. I was really privileged to meet with him uh, last month when I was in Washington. He's an Army vet. And he wrote this, I lost both of my legs in battle while defending our nation. I've, I'll never give up fighting for America. These repulsive actions demonstrate just how deeply ingrained hatred for America is with these pro-Hamas protesters, okay? Hatred for America is ingrained in these pro-Hamas protesters. And I want to show you one more really quick clip of the same Congressman Mass, this time he's being confronted by um, a an anti-Semitic lady from uh, Code Pink in the halls of Congress when he's on his way to his office. And I just want to show you a short thing of it. It goes on for like three minutes, and this uh, lady is attacking him because he's supporting Israel. And he's uh, and she, first she says she's a Palestinian, and then and then this is what she says. Well, I think that you are a heartless, soulless, cruel man. And today is Holocaust from Remembrance Day for my people, compliment. my people, Jewish people. And I am saying, as a Jew, we said never again, and it's happening okay. now. We say you are so again. hateful and disgusting. It's a shame. You are a crime against humanity. Right, so she says that she's speaking as a Jew. Right. You know, a second ago, she said she's, she's speaking as a Palestinian. Now she's saying she's speaking as a Jew. Forget about the fact that she doesn't seem to know who she is, and she's probably not Jewish or a Palestinian, but who cares? She says, as a Jew. This is something, this is the term that we've heard resonating through these campus riots, and for years, actually, you know, with people like P Peter Beinart and, and Not In My Name, If Not Now, all of these different groups, J Street, these pro-Zionist or anti-Zionist Jews and Jewish organizations that are making common cause with Hamas and with the Palestinian people who invaded Israel and massacred our people on October 7th and who support the massacre of October 7th with all their hearts and souls, right? So the Jews who are making common cause with these murderers, with these Nazis, are saying, as a Jew, as a Jew, I stand with the Palestinians. As a Jew, I oppose Zionism. As a Jew, blah, 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 you know, whatever. And, you know, and, and you look at them and you look at you look at at these calls by these bleeding idiots on the campuses, you know, calling death to America. And and you understand, no, it isn't about politics. It's about things that are much more basic than partisan politics and who's going to be the next document of the White House or who is who should be the prime minister of Israel. It's about what it means to be Jewish. It's about what it means to be an American. It's about, it's about what it means to be a member of a nation. And obviously what it means to be free. And, you know, what we're seeing here is that you have a very small minority in the United States and an equally small minority in Israel of people who are agreed that there's something inherently immoral and wrong about uh, 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 being a Jew, about being an American, about being a member of a nation and the citizen of your nation state, and about being free. They agree. They don't think that this works. This is why people like Senator Schumer, who has no conscience, as, uh, as, as uh, former Ambassador David Friedman wrote on Twitter this morning, because Schumer said he stands with Biden, all right, and, and when, when Biden is cutting us off at the kneecaps or higher. And, uh, and so you're looking at these people and you realize that what they're really going after is our sovereignty, is our ability to make sovereign decisions on our own behalf. I mean, what, what, what Sabine Tassa said there, wipe Gaza off the map, was the healthy and logical and rational position that any rational, 
thinking person would think after what happened on October 7th. Obviously, we cannot coexist with these people in charge of anything on the other side of a fence with us. Look at what they did. Look at what they believe. Look at what they stand for. Obviously, no rational nation would agree to, to exist with these people on the other side of the fence. Nobody would say that this is something that can lead to a stable equilibrium where we'll be able to go home to our houses, whether it's on, in, in the south across the border with Gaza or it's in the north across the border with Lebanon. These people cannot coexist safely with us because they exist on our border in order to come in and kill our kids and to kill our husbands and to kill our dogs and to kill us. That's why they're here. They're not here for any other reason. They don't want to live next to Metula because they also like apple orchards. You know, they also like the, the cool mountain air. They want to live next to Metula because they want to kill everybody in Metula. They want to kill everybody in Kiryat Shmona. And then they want to take over Metula and Kiryat Shmona after they've killed all the Jews in these places. That's what they want to do. That's what they did. And so here's the Biden administration. By the way, it's the same thing in America. Americans don't want to be overrun by 8 million illegals that nobody knows where they came from, who don't respect America's laws, who don't respect America's freedoms, who, don't, who, who have contempt for the American way of life, because if they didn't, then they would be trying to enter legally. Their first act as, as, as residents of the United States wouldn't be to cross the border illegally. So why, why are they being allowed in? Why did the border disappear the day that Joe Biden was inaugurated into office? It disappeared because he and his administration and very large portions of the Democratic Party don't share the view that American values are worth preserving. Don't share the view that America is the last greatest hope for mankind. They don't think that America should be the land of the free and the home of the brave. They think that the United States should be the land of the serfs and the hope and 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 the home of the weak and cowardly. That's why they're indoctrinating people to feel that they've been victimized or that they're victims, that they're victims of circumstance, that they're not actors, that they're not that boldness is not required to get through this world, but rather meekness. And respect for authority and for your betters and accepting uh, wisdom that was invented uh, five minutes ago in an, in an Instagram reel um, and not questioning it because it was put out by your betters. Now, that's what they're indoctrinating Americans to become. That's why they're saying that up is down and down is up and a man is a woman and a woman is a man. And anyway, there's no such thing as either of them. That, that's why. Because how do you destroy a nation by making people think that their nation and everything that they believe in and, and reality is all wrong and evil and that what you really have to do is build constructs. And in the constructs, you're good if you go with the people who make up the constructs and you're bad if you think that this is stupid and wrong and immoral and inhuman and anti-human and and. Take care of the people who live in your country first and worry about the United States first. You know, all of these things sort of go together in this melange and it's, and it's repeating itself in Israel today where you have people like Senator Schumer, Schumer ask, acting as a court Jew for the most anti-Semitic administration we've ever seen, calling for the overthrow of Israel's leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, in the middle of a war for our survival and his replacement by somebody who will be an American an American stooge who will come in here and lose the war and accept this, this uh, position where we become a vassal state of the Democratic Party that hates us. And that's basically what's at stake here. Gotti Taub wrote a fantastic article about it that came out yesterday in Tablet Magazine. You know, you, you, why, why are they calling for the ouster of Prime Minister Netanyahu? They're calling for the Prime Minister's ouster because he's the only thing that stands between us and and the Americans accomplishing their goal of destroying our freedom and our land and transforming us into a vassal state of the Democratic Party that wants to destroy Jewish freedom in the land of Israel and make us into this compliant, weak dependency that breathes in and out as a pleasure 
of senior American officials like Maher Bitar, the director of intelligence in the National Security Council, Hadi Amar, the special envoy to the Palestinians in the State Department, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, Jake Sullivan, the, the National Security Advisor, who both you know are enabling Iran's nuclear weapons programs to reach fruition. Um, that's who we're supposed to obey, because there are betters, because they're the ones who are telling us what we have to do. We can't go into Rafah. That's what Biden said. If you go into Rafah, we're going to launch an arms embargo, if you will. If the United States is embargoing arms to Israel, then how far away is the Security Council resolution authored by the United States demanding an international arms embargo of Israel? And by the way, the United States has been implementing, forcing other countries not to sell us weapons since the very outset. I spoke about it a couple months ago that uh, the uh, German chancellor agreed to sell Israel 155 millimeter tank shells and he immediately got a phone call from Biden that day after the like hours after the sale was announced and suddenly the sale disappeared. So they're going after they're going to American allied governments, Israel's friends, Israel's allied governments and saying you're not allowed to sell guns to Israel anymore. And then you had Amsterdam coming out, the Dutch saying that they weren't going to give us uh, spare parts for our F35s, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Canada like we needed yeah, we needed those those Canadian horses or whatever it is that they make there. So, you know, I mean, that's that's where we are. That's what the Americans are already doing. So, you know, we, we don't we, we have bad choices, I guess, but we have the same bad choices as the American people do. And I think that that the uh, that the recognition, because, I mean, there's really like no holding back anymore. There's a question like, can we can we go full out? I mean, are we in an open confrontation? Because if we're in an open confrontation with the Americans, then. You know, there are things that we can say and do that we can't do if we're trying to avert one. So at least, you know, the good thing about what Biden is doing is that he's given us no choice because it's obvious that he's done. You know, he's in open betrayal mode. You know, I, I, there was an incredible story. I was interviewed on One America uh, News Network this week, uh, right before Biden gave a speech at the Holocaust Museum about Yom HaShoah. Um, I think it was the day before yesterday. It's like Tuesday. Anyway, so... Biden was going to go up and, and they interviewed me, what do I think, and yada, yada, yada. And, and what was interesting about that speech, was, well, it wasn't a bad speech, but it doesn't reflect his policies. No, not at all. You know, anti-Semitism is bad. Oh, the Jews are terrible, right? I mean, that like his policy is the Jews are terrible and his rhetoric is, you know, anti-Semitism is bad. So, you know, the thing that was funny about that speech, right, is, is that it came out, I think it was an AP report that said that the administration waited for the official announcement to, to drop that they were embargoing arms on Israel or halting arms shipments to Israel. I guess embargo isn't the right word. Halting arms shipments to Israel until after he gave the speech. Why? Because they wanted the shots of Jews sitting in the audience and clapping, you know, to Biden's uh, uh, commitments to fighting anti-Semitism. That's why. They needed the photo op so they could use it in their campaign to show what a good friend of the Jews Biden is. And, you know, I mean, Gadi in his, in his article, when he was explaining how they're trying to in install this potentate, this, this uh, American puppet, Benny Gantz, to replace Netanyahu, he said that he doesn't think that Israel is going to be surviving, they cannot survive another four years of, of, a Biden, of a Biden administration. And I think it's fairly clear what another four years of a Biden administration will look like. I mean, it it will be it will be to transform Israel into an international pariah. It will treat Israel as if we're apartheid South Africa to try to bring about the collapse of this country economically with economic trade boycotts, with um, with arms embargoes, et cetera, so that um, you know you have to have clandestine uh, trade through third countries and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, may, and and place us into an economic chokehold, um, in order to foment a um, an internal color revolution, which they've already been doing for over you know a year with the left wing riots before October seventh, and they're doing more and more now of to try to, you know, it, get a very small minority of Israelis to oust the one prime minister who's willing to stand up to the Americans. You know, and and infiltrating into our government, into our war cabinet, with G Betty Gantz and Gadi Eisenkot, and 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 even Gallant, the defense minister, who's so 
hostile to the prime minister who gave him his job. Um, so all of these things they're doing, and you know they'll try to do more of them going forward. Um, and I think you know what we saw this morning after Biden's CNN speech is uh, we had a senior diplomatic source and the UN ambassador Gilad Erdogan both saying that you know the American people have to see what Biden is doing to Israel and that this is going to cost him in the election. And until this morning, that was the first time that I ever heard uh, either a senior diplomatic source or any Israeli official actually making statements that uh, are related to the U.S. presidential elections that are saying, we don't want Biden to get reelected. I saw on uh, on Abu Ali uh, Telegram page, which does a lot of the stuff with the Arab media, that they show the footage from the from from inside of Gaza and places like that. So they did a poll of their of their members on this channel. You know, who do you support uh, in the U.S. presidential elections? And um, Trump got eighty percent. Biden got eight percent. And uh, don't know got 12%, so don't know, got 50% more support than Biden did, okay? And obviously it's not a scientific poll and yada, 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 but it definitely reflects the way that Israelis view Biden. And you'll have this 8% of Israeli elites, like the army trying to say, oh, but we got so much from Biden and CENTCOM has really been great with operational cooperation. I think that's risable. I don't think that that's true. I think that they've intervened and that they don't know what they're doing. These are the people who screwed up everything in Afghanistan and in Iraq. The last thing that we want is their input on how to fight our war because they don't <clears throat> know how to win wars. They only know how to lose them. But be that as it may, you know, they're praising all the support that we've gotten until now from the Americans. Obviously, that support is over from the Biden administration's perspective. And, and yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, People who care about fighting anti-Semitism in the United States, that is Jews, uh, shouldn't vote for Biden. Uh, they should vote for Trump, who actually fought anti-Semitism in America, only to be demonized by the blob as an anti-Semite, even though he was the most philo-Semitic president in American history. And, you know, he, he most pro-Israel president in American history, the best at fighting anti-Semitism in American history. And so he was pilloried by the left that is anti-Semitic. All right. And and we're seeing that playing out now. All right. So I think that Jews who vote for Biden have a death wish. I mean, he he will destroy the American Jewish uh, community without a doubt if he's given a second term in office. And he'll use communist Jews like Tony Blinken and Rob Malley and Medea Benjamin or whoever all these fake Jews as the Jew Jews are to, to promote this. Um, and that'll happen. And they're going after the Jewish state. That's happening now. We know that it'll just be worse because all the guardrails, to the extent that they even exist, will be gone. And, you know, what they're doing to America, what are you going to do in a second term? You like it? Then vote for him. You know, you don't want borders? Great. Then vote for Biden. Next time, your vote will matter much less because they'll give the vote to all of the illegal aliens who are who are flooding the United States. No doubt about it. You know, I mean, that, that'll just happen. You like your justice system? Well, you know, think about it, right? What's it going to look like in four years if Biden gets reelected? You know, you like your sex? You like loving the opposite sex? You like families? You like having kids? You, you, you want to be able to educate your children the way that you believe? Well, then you probably don't want another four years of Biden. Right? You want the United States to be secure in this world? You want them to make rational policy decisions in foreign policy? You want them to stand with America's allies so that America's allies will be strong? And you want them to side against America's enemies so that America's enemies will be weak? Well, the Biden administration's foreign policy is to strengthen America's enemies and betray America's allies. Uh, so that's not what you want. And, you know, I don't want to turn this into a Trump commercial, but I might as well turn it into a Trump commercial. Trump stood with America's allies and stood against America's enemies. And as a result, you had peace in the Middle East. You had America secure in its borders and becoming more powerful. You know, you, you know, it, it, I don't know, maybe it's a hard decision for some people because the demonization of Republicans and of Trump has been 
so successful. I mean, same here in, in Israel. Why would anybody vote for Benny Gantz, who is so obviously getting direction from a hostile foreign government over Benjamin Netanyahu, who that foreign government, hostile foreign government, has been spending the last two years trying to throw out of power by demonizing him, you know, because propaganda is very powerful. That's why. But just think about first principles, because that's what this is about. We've been badgered for years saying, oh, don't turn Israel into a partisan issue. And the response has always been, nobody here is doing anything to turn it into a partisan issue. If the Democratic Party is changing, it's not because of anything that Israel did. It's because of the people who are in control of the Democratic Party. It's because of the people who fund the Democratic Party. It's because of the people who, who are attracted to the Democratic Party and become the ground troops of the Democratic Party. That's why. It's because the Democratic Party has been captivated by hardened communist leftists who hate the United States and hate Jews. That's why. So, you know, how is Israel supposed to make AOC like us? How are we supposed to make AOC voters like us? How are we supposed to, you know, what what possible contribution did we make to shaping, you know, the worldview of people who are burning the American flags on the streets of New York City? What did Israel do to promote hatred of the United States of America? Nothing. Nothing at all. What did Israel do to promote communism in U.S. public schools? Also nothing. You know, how did Israel undermine American security? Well, you have all these conspiracies that say that Israel brought is America into the Iraq war, even though we supported it once the, once the Bush administration said that they wanted to go in. But Israel opposed it and said, no, Iran is the problem, not Iraq. But once the Americans say, no, we're going in, you know, we, we think Saddam Hussein is a problem, then fine, you know, we salute the flag and say, go ahead, we'll help you any way we can. And it was the Israelis who trained Americans in counter-terror warfare that enabled the Marines in Fallujah and the U.S. Army and other places to actually, you know, uh, uh, penetrate the terror, the, the, the terror chains that had been formed inside of the cities of Iraq and conduct a successful counterinsurgency. We had Israeli trainers going to Fort Bragg to teach the Americans how to do it. When I was in Iraq in 2003 with the 3rd Infantry Division, they had no idea what they were getting into. They thought that they were invading Paris in 1945. They didn't know anything about Iraq. And it was only when they got in trouble that they suddenly called Israel and asked for help. They didn't want Israel's input about whether or not to invade Iraq. Israel had nothing to do with that decision. We opposed it. All the same... You know, because we're loyal allies and we stood with the United States after they made the decision, we're blamed. No, we're not blamed because of anything we did. We're blamed because we're Jewish, and it's always the proper way to go forward when you get in trouble is to just blame the Jews, and then everything will be fine. It's never true, but it doesn't matter. That's not why you're saying it to begin with. You're not saying it because you've, you know, you've researched the issue and you've come to this conclusion, unless your research involves going to anti-Semitic conspiracy theories to find out what the anti-Semitic conspiracists are saying so that you can quote it and pretend that you did research. So, you know, when Israel is strong, America can walk away from the Middle East. When Israel's at peace with its neighbors because the United States is supporting the moderate forces in the Arab world and helping them to make peace with Israel, then America can disengage. But when the United States puts the Palestinians front and center in everything that happens in the Middle East and says, this is, this, this is the thing that needs to be solved. And what you're doing is you're taking the one problem that has no solution, except, by the way, total eradication, which is what Sabine Tassa said after her family was massacred, rightly, you know, in terms of Gaza. You know, if you don't want to do that, God forbid, then all you can do is ignore them, which is what in eventually, the Trump administration finally did, and that's how they got the Abraham Accords. But the United States under Biden and the Democrats don't want peace and stability. They don't want peace and stability in the United States, as Lee Smith wrote in Tablet. They want discord and chaos in the United States in order to undermine the American way of life. And they want discord and war in the Middle East in order to undermine the American way of life by discrediting everybody and everything that Americans believe in, first and foremost, by the way, the Bible, which says that the land of Israel belongs to the Jews. 
So again, this is not about politics. You know, even the college students aren't buying into this. So the youth vote is not voting on this issue. Or if it is, it's not necessarily voting for the Palestinians at all. And, you know, the, Michigan is not the be-all and the end-all of the, of the elections. And by the way, it's probably not going to be determined by the Muslim vote. It's probably going to be determined by the United Auto Workers. And, and when you look at what Biden is doing, you see that this is just Obama's legacy. Obama said at Grant Park, after the election, before he was inaugurated, he said, what did he say? We are four days away from fundamentally transforming America. And that's what they aim to do. He got a, very far. He transformed the Democratic Party into a cultural Marxist party in his own image that hates Jews and hates America. And he believes that he will transform America into that vision in a second Biden administration. I think everything's out in the open. You know, I didn't talk about the American election too much, certainly not in this way before. But I think it's time to put our cards on the table. Biden is done with this country of Israel. So we have no choice but to be done with Biden. Anyway, those are my thoughts. And uh, next week is Yom Atzmaut, Yom Zikaron, our Memorial Day for our fallen. And uh, Yom Atzmaut the day after because we live because of our sacrifice, not because of America. Uh, and so we'll be talking about that next week. Anyway, take care. See you soon. Have a good weekend. Sabbat shalom.